<laughs> okay, uh, quick minor correction. It's the truth of everything, so it's even, even more hyperbolic than the truth of facts. Uh, and I'll maybe get into the reasons why we chose such a name uh, when we get onto it. A little worried that um, we started out by saying this is going to be an enormous amount of fun because some about what I'm going to be talking about is actually going to feel like it's actually a tooth extraction uh, because I am talking about the state of news, media, information, communication, and you guys north of the border are probably living in what we would consider paradise at the moment by comparison. But in the United States, it's, it's really a bit of a mess. So um, before I talk about what you know, the blockchain and blockchain technology and solutions that have something to do with it, how it might be helpful for dealing with the chaos of our current times, I'm going to put you through a little bit of the pain about what the reality is, because we need to actually define what the problem is before we can figure out how to fix it. So anybody familiar with this photo? It was doing the rounds recently. Sorry, yep, one, okay, cool. Um, so it's a picture of a kid crying in a cage, obviously. Um, and it's you know, Hispanic, probably Mexican descent. It's fairly obvious what this talk, what this is about. All of you have been following the news. Um, and it you know, had a, a fairly sort of productive uh, life cycle on Twitter and elsewhere for a while because it was seen as a way to emphasize just how bad the policy of uh, removing children from immigrant parents ha has been. And it was helped along by this guy, uh, Jose Antonio Vargas, who puts out this tweet, you know, this is what happens when our government believes people are illegal, kids in, in cages. It's, uh, you know, it was shared, was it, say, 25,000 times. It was retweeted by him. You look, it's, it's, it's kind of fake news. Um, and I say kind of because the key, key point here is that it's lacking context. This is not an actual kid at the border uh, of, uh, you know, of the United States in a cage. This is a, this is a staged uh, protest in Washington, and they put the kid in the cage as a kind of an artistic act. So he's kind of right, right, saying this is what happens. This is a statement about how bad this policy is. But without the context, this thing spread everywhere. And, it, you know, and ultimately, for those of us who support this cause, and I'm a big fan of Jose Antonio Vargas, who is a, a tireless defender of the rights of undocumented people, and I married a family of, of, of Hispanic immigrants. So I take this topic really passionately, and I care very much about it. But this doesn't help because it just reinforces this concept on either side of the echo chamber that one side is just monkeying with the facts and telling lies. Um, you know, but ultimately, you know, th this, this to me is, is something that I can't help myself getting into as well because I see, I see memes like this and can't help but promoting them because I feel very, very much aligned with it. This is the way that, that Trump voters are describing this, this, this situation, that, um, that in fact, you know, this is, this, is, this is Obama's making. This is something that, that goes back to Clinton and then Obama, and that there's nothing Trump can do about it until he miraculously saves the day and ends the policy when it, they just can't distinguish between the difference between a policy and a law. And that obfuscation has been extremely frustrating because it just spreads everywhere and says, the implementation of this act is what we're talking about here, not, not the existence of a law. And that but you can't deal with it because the, the spread, the, the, the echo chamber, the constant reinforcement of this, of this notion that there's a liberal lie uh, around this is, is very hard to break when it just spreads as, as viciously as it does. And there's another problem for those of us who are on the liberal side of it, and that is that I think there's an ethics bias. Again, um, if you look down on, on this Twitter list, there's somebody saying she's questioning that photo from, from, uh, from Vargas and saying, I need to know the source of that photo. I'm not going to put this out there. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't really seem to be spreading a lie. So, you know, if, if there's a machine out there that is deliberately creating disinformation and there are a bunch of guys on one side who are saying, oh, well, let's make sure we get our facts right, that asymmetry is pretty dangerous when it comes to what the facts are. But look at me, I'm falling into the same trap, right? I'm, 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 I'm calling for her and for these guys and saying, we're the good guys, those are the bad guys. We're all going into these echo chambers. It's, it's, it's sort of instinctive, it's tribal. This is a really big deal. And it means that the very phrases that we're using to describe what's going on have distorted things. Fake news emerged initially as a description of literally these fake news stories that were being produced, literal disinformation. 
Now it's a, per a pejorative that's used by Trump and others to describe mainstream media for the way that they you know, lie about the reality. So we can't even use these terms anymore. Everything's morphing. And then we've got you know, Kellyanne Conway's famous alternative lack, l facts, and you can see the, I fiddled around with some of the letters there to give you a sense of what she's really talking about. But you know, it's, it's leaving us in this very lost state. Because if, you can, if, if somebody who speaks for the President of the United States can actually get away with describing the fact that he, you know, he's lying by using a term like alternative facts, it does leave us in this completely disorientated state of wondering, well, what actually is a fact, if that's possible, right? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about you know, the blockchain and how it's useful. But I'm also going to talk to you about how you know, it's actually getting worse. Uh, there's, a, there's an industry that I have a lot to do with. It's the cryptocurrency uh, world. And um, these guys are taking the echo chamber problem to a new level, because not only are they all vested in the passion of this story that they're trying to tell, they've got money on the table. Right? These crypto tokens, some of them are worth a lot of money. And so it's distorting people's senses of what is right and wrong, because they're completely defending their position, and they're, and they're confusing, I would argue, the notions of truth and, and fact around whatever their investment position is. So now we're throwing money into the mix of the echo chamber problem, and it's getting even worse. And this example here, I think, is a telling one. And I was particularly upset with this, because this is Michael Arrington, who's one of the founders of TechCrunch, a former journalist, right? And he happens now to be a big holder of Ripple, XRP. I don't know if any of you know the, 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 the world of crypto, but XRP is a, uh, you know, it's a very big, uh, large market cap uh, token that's connected to the company Ripple. And Nathaniel Popper, a, a very well-respected New York Times journalist, had put out a story saying that he talked to all these bankers and they were not using XRP. And therefore, the claims that were being made that were justifying this massive spike in the price were probably overstated. Michael Arrington comes out and says, name your sources, total bullshit. The implication being, you're lying, you've got a bias, you obviously have it in for Ripple. And what happens was an, an enormous, like, you know, big echo chamber mob attack on Popper. He's obviously biased, he's obviously lying, he's obviously making up his sources. I'm a former journalist, <laughs> he is not, right? <laughs> and there's a reason why, it's not because he's a good guy or because he's inherently honest, because his job's on the line. There is no way that a New York Times journalist, for the sake of doing this, would lie like that about his sources. There was way too much at stake. The stories of Jason Blair and these, these stories are just rife across our industry. So, you know, and yet, the assumption now amongst these people, because of their vested interest in the story, is that obviously the journalist is lying. This is a really problematic state of affairs because there's no sort of sense of trust in, in anyone. But journalists themselves are playing into this. You know, I don't think this is, and this is, this is just, part of this cycle, the defensiveness, this natural tribalism almost, brings itself into the profession itself. So the Boston Globe, this says Sunday, April 9, 2017, was actually April 9, 2016. This was a fake front page that the Boston Globe put out in the midst of the Trump campaign. It's eerily, uh, uh, you know, prescient in fact, if you look at the trade war headline and the deportations. But should journalists be doing this? Should news organizations be out there like producing fake news, albeit with clear irony involved and a kind of a statement and an a, a, a editorializing on their front page? I don't know. I'm not sure that this is a healthy state of affairs. And I think we're reinforcing the problem the more we do this. So how do we get here? You know, what, what, is, what is going on? Like, let's, let's start by looking at um, this particular case that emerged also during the elections, and I think it's just fascinating for how it defines the problem. So we're all looking for the blame and saying, this is all Moscow, and it was all, you know, the elections were rigged, and, 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 they, and you know, the Trump campaign was either in on it or not. We've got a whole host of lawsuits involved and people being up on criminal charges and so forth. I think the real issue is something that, that, that's much harder than just sort of pointing the finger at, at bad guys. I'm not saying there aren't bad guys in it, but there's a system here. So this is Velas in Macedonia, and it's a town of about 50,000 people. And BuzzFeed wrote a wonderful story in, I think it's probably around October of 2016, showing how these kids basically made tens of thousands of dollars producing fake news, this is truly fake news, 
that was just absolutely unsubstantiated. They were just literally making up it out of their, out of their heads and placing it onto Facebook where it would be picked up in the right-wing Trump echo chambers and shared tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, generating all these clicks and spinning all the, all the page views back to their sites. They were earning Google cents. They were, they were earning, you know, something like $5,000 a month, which isn't a huge amount of money, but compared to the $300 a month average wage, it was a killing in Vellus, right? Just by making it up. And, you know, this is, this is a huge challenge. Uh, because uh, how are serious news organizations supposed to compete with this? But I'm actually saying, I don't think that it really began at Velas. There's a little bit of a player here, because it's not really about people or even places. It's about a system. And let's think about Facebook, because again, I'm not even just going to blame Facebook itself, but I'm going to blame the models in which we've built our control of information. Facebook has a secret algorithm. We don't know how its algorithm is actually designed. We do know what it does, and it does what it does is it, it, it creates like audiences. It takes through algorithmic studies, AI, constant sort of reading of people's habits and behaviors and all sorts of other data, and says, you obviously like this sort of thing. You obviously like that sort of thing. I'm going to keep feeding these, these stories to you and those stories to you. And you know what? That's, gonna, that's a great business model for me, because the more I create those like audiences, the more I can generate platform advertising. This is key. Platform advertising as opposed to content advertising. They don't care about the contentizing. That's up to the Macedonian kids to generate, or the New York Times. You guys, good luck with that. But what we're going to do is, is earn advertising through an algorithm that drives all of you people into these echo chambers. I think this is fundamentally unfair, as I think it's a breach of the principles of democracy. If, if the dominant platform for our information dissemination is actually rewarding people who spend less money on getting the facts straight than a news organization that spends hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the balance and get to get the right story, we're doing something incredibly wrong. And all this discussion about what Facebook should be doing is really missing the point. It's about that structure, that algorithm, that, that idea of where our priorities lie. And it makes us think about what is Facebook? And I'll talk about that in a little while. Anyway, with this system, we get these lies heading out there. Governor, this one, look at, look at 82,000 times it was shared. This is one of the Macedonian stories, right? Um, people love it because they repeat it because it, 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 it releases something positive to them. So um, first, before, before we sort of like pull ourselves back a little bit from this kind of horrible sort of state of affairs, and actually think, something a little bit more positively about what social media is. So this is a book I wrote with a guy called Oliver Luckett uh, about two years ago called Social Organism. We sort of, our main thesis was that social media is, is a completely new chaotic system for information dissemination and that it functions like an organism. And the only way to understand it is to see it in those terms. But the most important, but one of the other important things that we, we really talked about was how completely disruptive to the distributive structure it was. And and what it's done by breaking down the challenge of time and distance when it comes to, to access to information was to destroy the barriers to entry for who can actually speak. And I was at the, um, uh, I was at the, the MAC, the Museo, uh, uh, well, my French is terrible, Arti Contemporary, the Contemporary Arts Museum, and I saw this great um, exhibition yesterday by Rafael uh, Lozano uh, Amer, and he has one exhibition called Vals Vos Alta, and he's talking about the um, hundreds of students who were killed in Mexico City in 1968. And it's kind of been wiped from the Mexican history books, and no one really talks about it. We know about all the other riots in 68 and everything else. No one really talks about the Mexico City massacre very much. And his point is that their voices were lost. And so his art, his art installation was a megaphone and a way to sort of express this need for everybody to have a chance to have their say. And that's really what social media is. And it's interesting because it breaks down the barriers. Through, ye through the centuries we've had it, it used to be the church. The church was the only institution that had the power to tell us what to do. They had the word of God. And only one person in the town could read. That was the priest, right? And then we, and then we figured out how to teach everybody to read. And Gutenberg invented the, 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 the printing press. And all of a sudden, we spread more widely access to information. But we still centralized control of it because we had media organizations that would distill it. And you know, ultimately, what you had was an infrastructure of power that was built upon physical assets. So until social media came along, um, 
the barriers to entry that allowed you know, the control of information to be dominated by these institutions were physical. If you owned the printing presses, TVs, satellite stations, that sort of thing, it was very expensive for anybody else to come on and build all that architecture, so you got to control it, right? But now, what we have is a completely different distribution infrastructure. What's going on now is that the means by which information is spread has got nothing to do with the physical assets. It's not really about the computers or the, or the cables or the Wi-Fi connections. It's about us. It's about our, our receptiveness in our brains. How do we respond? How do we chemically respond to emotions? That's literally what's going on. And so when a fake news, if I'm a, 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 a you know, Trump supporter and I'm angry about the state of my country and I see uh, a, a story that says, you know, Finally, they found Obama's fake you know, Kenyan birth certificate. I'm going to jump on that because it's a dopamine release, right? So, so the real power of distribution in this new age is, is based on two things. How many connections you have as an individual, your follower list, right, your friends, and how well you connect, your emotional power. Just think of how different that is from the old physical infrastructure. We're dealing with a completely different distribution animal. So, on the basis of that, you know, we have to start thinking about how we are going to manage this situation. One of the problems that we face is there's no longer what was known as the Overton window. This guy's Joseph uh, Overton, who uh, he was at a think tank in Washington. He came up with this notion, it was a pretty accurate one, that the me mass media of the day uh, essentially had a window of acceptable views. If you were like a hardcore Marxist revolutionary, you probably wouldn't get any chance to have your voice heard in the great sort of public discourse of the day. But neither if you were, you know, a rabid, uh, you know, white supremacist, right? So there's this window of acceptability, and that's what the mass, how the mass media kind of, in, in, you know, managed the conversation. And that was good and it was bad, obviously, because we do want all our voices to be heard, but at least it meant there was this filtering process of acceptability. Now that it's gone, we get this. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely stunning that you can have such blatant, racist, anti-Semitic stuff that's just flying over Twitter, that there are, you know, there are people everywhere who are out there reinforcing us and, and holding up the view that by not being allowed to present these ideas, they are having their rights to free speech suppressed. And this is, this is the reality we live in when there is no longer any Overton window, because everybody has a chance to say something, even people who you know, use these incredibly racist images. So the instinct people have is to say, Facebook and Twitter, they need to start censoring your platforms. We hear it across the world. Control hate speech. Get your facts straight. Make sure it's true. But these are platforms. These are distribution platforms. So, you know, when, when Facebook's algorithm and then its people came in to do this, and they saw this, said that the classic photo from Vietnam, it got censored, right? Do we want a system that does that because it's got some basic rule set that says, naked bodies, bad, cut out, right? Let's give you another example. Just recently, the, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence was run through Facebook's algorithm. It was also caught for hate speech and banned, right? So, I really don't think this is the answer. We can't put the notion, it's just simply impossible for one institution to manage the world's facts in this way. And it's also the wrong way of thinking about it because Facebook is not a publisher, they are a channel. They're not in charge of content. And, and, and they haven't built their model that way, but we, but we think of them in these terms. We've got all of our understanding of what our system works like in the wrong way. And it, you know, it's gonna get even harder because the Internet of Things, billions of devices out there all talking to each other are going to have to rely on each other's information. So we're going to have to trust each other's you know, information, in, again, in an environment where there's nobody in charge, where there's no Overton window, where there's no filter saying this is true and that's not. So chaos in the IoT world is kind of scary. All right, so let's break down how we might think about this. One way is that to use this classic maxim, right? All truth is relative, and I think that's actually true. I think this is a, a postmodern reality, and I think objectively I would say I believe that. But it's actually not very useful. I think this is more useful. All truth is consensus. So there's a lot of information that 
there's no way to define exactly what is true or not, but we've all come around to agreeing that this is the most, that this is the thing we're going to work with, right? So what exactly is the absolutely true GDP of Canada? There's no such thing. I mean, there might be, but that's impossible to actually measure, right? It's a set of estimations that have gone through a process of checking and double checking, and we've reached a consensus about what that number is. And it applies to, by the way, everything. Every number, every, every measure of inflation, every price, every, every earnings number, you know, all this sort of stuff, it's built upon consensus. That's what we have. The question is how we develop that consensus, and this is where the blockchain gets kind of interesting. And where it gets interesting is it starts to think about things differently from a regulatory perspective. So rather than just saying somebody at the top is going to, to be the censor and say this is true and that's not true, what it's going to do is say I'm going to put a price on, on this. And the thing is what we've, what we've lost in social media is that there's no price anymore for honesty, for integrity. It doesn't cost me anything to lie. I can just reproduce myself. Look, at Donald Trump's got half of his followers are bots. And there's no incentive for him to shut those things down, right? So, because there's no control over it. It doesn't cost anything to spin up a bot. So price, actually, this is the, the, the great logic of what, how blockchain thinks about these things. Putting a cost on things is how you regulate, how you bring order to the system. So you can think of it as price as honesty, or like, what cost do I place on lying or on antisocial speech or whatever form of information we want to control for? So Bitcoin came up with the first instance of what this was. And essentially, you know, the blockchain is a consensus distributed ledger, right? A whole bunch of computers all have to agree on an existing ledger. And how do we know that they're not lying? How do we know that they're just recreating versions of themselves so that they can vote their own thing, right? The whole bot problem exists enormously in the blockchain world. What Satoshi Nakamoto did was to impose a cost of computation on every computer. So every time you place a vote on what you say is the validity of the ledger, you know, it's, and it's not really a vote, but it effectively works like one, you, um, you have to do this computation, which costs resources. It costs electricity, and it costs compu computing power. You're now in a very indirect, decentralized way, because this is a protocol that nobody controls, imposing on the system a cost that doesn't depend upon a regulatory authority in the top, right? So it starts to give us the at least foundation of a way to think about how a completely decentralized media structure like social media, we might start to think differently about how we regulate truth. Because what this is doing is creating a consensus, not an absolute truth, but a consensus view of what we all agree is the shared truth. We all have the same ledger, and every time a new transaction comes in, we all see if we agree on that. We have these set of rules and we move on to the next, the next transaction that way. Constant, real-time consensus about what we all agree to be this common truth. And what it comes up with is this ledger, this, this immutable ledger. And it's immutable because nobody controls it. Nobody can step in and change it. You can't go back and double spend. You can't change it uh, after the fact. So it's an established set of facts. Uh, and it has all these sort of crypt cryptographic checks on it and so forth. Um, that, that's actually sort of something that gives us a lot of power. I'm going to talk through some of the use cases as to how it's being applied to uh, the digital world, because Bitcoin was the first use case, but now that we have this idea that common record keeping and across a distributed structure that, that nobody controls is an incredibly powerful and useful thing for society, we can start thinking about other transactions that need to be verified. Because what, what we're really talking about with the blockchain is the problem of trust in valuable data. We needed Bitcoin to solve the money problem because the internet was fine for how you did the structure of information. It didn't know how to deal with value. Because when something is valuable, we, we don't trust each other, and we need an intermediary in the middle to keep that record. So Bitcoin said, hang on, let's do a decentralized system for, for that value exchange. And we think about it as money, but it could be anything. Anything that we care about, anything that we think is valuable and sensible, sensitive can be placed through this system. I think that's where the power of it starts to lie. It's very important, potentially, for the sake of data veracity, particularly in the IoT world. So how do I know that this device is always giving reliable data? I can track its record through the blockchain and, and potentially go back and look at it and see, is it consistently complying what, with what the consensus sees as the reliable form? And make judgment calls, not on absolute truth, but on sort of a consensus collective view of what 
uh, is acceptable and normal behavior for a particular device. And so data veracity from that text side of it comes useful, but that, that concept and that word is, is, just, is just vital, I think, for what, the way the digital uh, future moves forward. Now, another way to think about this and another uh, uh, project that has been built on top of blockchain that I think feeds into some of, uh, of how we might grapple with facts and truth is prediction markets. There's a company called Augur that has just, just gone live, uh, I think, yesterday. Um, and, it, and it deals in prediction markets, meaning that you can bet with somebody else on an outcome of anything. Right? It's a decentralized system. It doesn't, it's not regulated. People can enter into contracts and say, I you know, bet that it's going to rain tomorrow, and I bet it won't, and let's see what that bet is. And that sounds really pretty inane, right? That's, that's not exactly the most uh, exciting thing in the world. But what's really interesting about it is how do we, in a decentralized structure like that, verify the truth of whether or not it did rain? Where does that, and, 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 and now that there's money on the table, how are we going to be incentivized to make sure that we both in this decentralized structure agree that this source of truth is one that we can, we can accept? And what they're coming up with is this notion of reputation tokens. And so there are people or institutions or machines or whoever who spit out information, who earn reputation for, for being accurate. And that gets fed into these prediction markets. So you think about what we're doing here now. We're placing incentives and money and cost and, and, and sort of skin in the game into our notion of truth. Right? This, is, this is where it starts to get interesting. So one other way we can think about it is like, you know, you've probably all heard the expression, you are not Facebook's uh, customer, you are Facebook's producer, right? And it is, it's a core problem here, is that we're not actually rewarding or incentivizing or, or people for two very important components of what this ecosystem function at. One is the actual content production, but the other, just as importantly, is our attention. We're, our attention is our, is our scarce resource that we're giving up, and we're not being rewarded for it appropriately. In fact, we're being hijacked and stolen <laughs> and used and abused into the breach of our democracy. So, you know, this is, this is a core problem. We don't think about it accurately because we think it's a free service. Isn't that wonderful? We're, we're constantly paying. We're paying with our data. Data is a currency. Data is a currency. Data is a currency. We've got to understand this, right? So. This is the way Facebook is designed. They've obfuscated this whole thing, and they've they basically converted that currency into dollars. Um, Steemit is, an, is a you know, fairly basic attempt to, to grapple from this from a decentralized structure. Nobody owns Steemit. Everybody just gets rewarded in some sort of curated system for their content. It doesn't work very well, because you get back to this whole problem of incentives, because uh, Steam ends up being the, the, the currency that everybody owns. And so the stories that get rewarded and constantly voted up in the system are about Steam, which isn't really very useful, um, or a Steam it. But, but it's, it's, it's giving us the foundation for how we might grapple with these things. How do we build through these, uh, this architecture where the distribution of funds, the reward for behaviors, the, uh, the ownership of, the, of, of, of all of that data ends up being in the hands of the, of the community around a structure of consensus that we can all accept rather than one that is closed and controlled by one you know, majority shareholder of a particular company, right? But I actually think that, that, you know, it, 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 that some of these ideas might not be ideally placed into an absolutely decentralized structure. I think that, in fact, the winner in this might one day be, if these guys ever wake up to it, some sort of consortium of these guys. Because they are the ones who are losing the most right now. They're spending oodles on lawyers, on newsrooms, and sending people into war zones. And, and, and news stories are still the foundation upon which we build everything. And all of our arguments about the democracy and the state of our world still start at the very beginning with some story that, that some news organizations spent money and risk and put journalists' lives on the ground to try and get the truth on. And yet they feel compelled to, to place all their content on a system that's steering all their users over to the Macedonian fake news. Um, why wouldn't they just form a consortium and say, we're going to produce a platform and this platform is open. Anyone can use it. Anyone can post on it. Um, it, it. It will have you know, a decentralized structure. There will be rewards for content. We'll have ways to do it. But, but because we have all of our interest in the truth, we should do this. This is just one of my pet, pet peeves. Um, 
one of the key lessons in this as well is that open source algorithms, we have to sort of applaud them. We need to, to uh, encourage them in every aspect of what we do in this current age. Um, the, as I said, the Facebook algorithm is closed. So, you know, if we at least knew how the system worked, you can make judgment calls on whether or not you want to post your material on that place. There, there, there is something about this need to have, to have these systems open that I think is, is essential. And I think it brings us to a core question uh, on, on how we think about these platforms. Um, you know, they're essentially monopolistic. Um, you know, if you look at Facebook, really, it, 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 I think it's pretty fair to say it has this monopolistic power. Google, very similar. In, its own, in their own realms. Should we view them as utilities? Now, that doesn't mean that we would necessarily regulate them as utilities. Do we have to have traditional regulation and, and rules around them? But if we start to conceive of them in those terms, um, maybe we should be thinking about a design of, of systems that, uh, that ultimately you know, allows us to, as a society, establish a set of reliable systems for this information. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there's all sorts of problems in, in not just the state of the world as it is, but in the solutions. Because you know, a blockchain is a, is a public ledger. And public ledgers are public, which means Cambridge Analytica might actually be able to still exist and abuse it and everything else. There's all sorts of challenges. There's questions around identity. How do we define identity in this age? Um, but we really have no choice because we're just not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. We are not going to go back to Joe Overton's world of centralized news organizations. This baby, whether we like it or not, has been born. Social media is here to stay. We need to think about what the tools are for how we would regulate this decentralized structure. And I think that the blockchain gives us the framework for how to think about it. And uh, I think that's about the best I can do. I wish I could offer you something sort of more of a magic bullet, but uh, that's, that's the way I want to leave it. I think I have about six minutes for questions, so if anybody's got some pressing things they want to ask. Yes, Francis. <laughs> 